Hello, and welcome to Castle Talk, where we talk to writers and creators of today's genre worlds. I'm your host, Jason Henderson, publisher at Castlebridge Media, and author of the new book, The Serpent's Nest, Young Captain Nemo, out now, like brand new now from Macmillan Children's Books. Tonight, we're chatting with Jack Dan, author of the book, Shadows in the Stone, from IFWG. This guy has an amazing biography. Jack Dan has written or edited over 75 books. He is the recipient of the Nebula Award, the World Fantasy Award twice, the Australian Arialis Award three times, the Cronus Award, the Daryl Award for Best Mid-South Novel, the Dipmar Award five times, uh, the Shirley Jackson Award. You've been honored by the Mark Twain Society, which makes you apparently an esteemed knight. Jack, welcome. Boy, that sounds good. Who, who is it that guy? <laughs> <laughs> Can we just stop the interview now while I'm ahead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, you need a card. <laughs> Don't you ever wish that that, uh, that that you could go into like a you're at a cocktail party and don't you wish you could just give somebody your like card and we have like your five bullets below it so they would go oh yeah no I want to talk to you or no I I, I don't want to talk to you <laughs> yeah well actually you know this I mean you know you know this well this business of being a writer if you're if you're okay if you're at a business cocktail party that's one thing but if you're just at a, at a cocktail party right. and someone comes up and 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 they 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 say what do you do I tell yeah. them I'm an advertiser right <laughs> if you tell them you're a writer the next thing you get is uh, well uh, have you published anything have you published anything yeah and and the curious and, thing is. If they haven't, if they haven't heard of you, even though they're an audience of one human, <laughs> then you lose all of your credibility <laughs> if they don't know you. You know, it, it 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 really it it really is true. I mean, it's almost aggressive. Like, what have you published, and why right. don't I know who you are? Yeah, yeah. I don't I I don't know how to make my way around that. The, the, okay. Of course, it's the a book. real it's a real it's a real kick. Yeah. When you when you tell them your name and they and they get all excited, but unfortunately for most of us mere mortals, I mean, right. I've got pals, you know, like George Martin, who does not have this problem. Right. For most of us, you know, <laughs> they're not going to say, "Oh my God, it's Jason. Oh, I love your work. You're phenomenal." Right. right. No, exactly. That, that's why it's so great when you actually, when, when you, you mentioned the, those are the, the non right If you're at a writing thing, you're at a conference or something, if you're a speaker and somebody's actually heard you, then you, then it's almost as though you've already been introduced. It's like, it's, yeah. it's like you're at a party in an old movie where, where the footman stands by the door and goes, you know, Jack Dan. <laughs> You know, and, and, you know I, miss, I miss a lot of that because, you know, over the years, it almost becomes family. You see people you haven't seen in, a, in yeah. a couple of, you know, in five years. And it was like you pick up the conversation that was five minutes ago. Yeah. And it yeah. used to be a great way to do business. Well, it will be again. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I write and I, and I also publish and I can't wait for the day that we're back, you know, going to conferences and getting tables and putting out a bunch of books and shaking hands and selling some books and stuff. I, I want those days. I, I mean, I, I, I'm just hungry for it. I'm hungry to get back out. You know, to, to go. Yeah, yeah. So, my, in fact, at one at one convention, I was partying, and yeah. this, this was in my younger years, and I was partying a bit too hard. So I don't <laughs> remember what had happened in the morning. Uh, mm -hmm. And and one of my pals, who was also an editor, uh, sat down next to me and said, "Look, we're interested in buying that book." Uh huh. I had to say, "What book?" <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's fabulous. I'm just trying to imagine what I would say. It was like, oh, I'm so glad. You know what? Can you send me a note about yeah. uh, what you liked about that idea? Because <laughs> what I was doing is I was brainstorming the idea. And it became the, the Vietnam anthology uh, uh, that I did with uh, uh, Jeannie Van Buren called In the Fields of Fire. Mm. Do you know, I just got this uh, a, a Vietnam book just today that I've never read. And it was famous in its day, but it hasn't been reprinted. It's called Home Before Morning, uh, which is about nurses in Vietnam. And um, uh, and it was made into the TV series China Beach back in the day. You know? Okay. The music from China Beach is great. Oh, and I think maybe that's why it's not available on streaming. It's just too much, yeah, yeah. Too much good music. If you want to read one of the best books on the Vietnam War, which was yeah. written as a juvenile, take a look at Joe Haldeman's War Year. All right. I... 
Unfortunately, it was it was published too early because he published it after he got back, mm-hmm. and uh, you know it it hadn't it, it hadn't become you know the whole idea hadn't become front of mind uh, at that at that time. But it's you know it's it's a brilliant book. Of course, I'm screwing up this interview. I'm supposed to be talking about no, know, no, it, 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 we will. But, but I'm so fascinated. You're, you're totally right. I'm mean, I'm so fascinated by how pop culture and culture of the post-Vietnam era goes through phases. And, and there's a period where we're just haunted by it. Like if you look at, at, at stuff that's at the height of pop culture, like Miami Vice, Miami Vice is haunted by the Vietnam War. You know, yeah. it, 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 it's, it's just so amazing how all this stuff from the 80s, because the war at that point, Saigon's like, the, you know, the, the, the fleeing Saigon is 1975, fall Saigon. So you're just talking about 10 years later, and it is, it's bonkers. It's the same way that the 50s is, is haunted by, you, by world. You and I have similar tastes. Uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a Miami Vice guy, too. Okay, so where are okay, we going? Okay, so the book, is, the book is Shadows in the Stone, and it is not you Vietnam at all. You and I could do this for four hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is much too much fun. <laughs> Um, so, so the funny thing, the funny thing about Shadows in the Stone, this is the new book and you got some amazing, like pre pre pre-release Kim Stanley Robinson did this just amazingly bonkers, positive. He he loved it. And, and the, the book is, um, how best to put it? It is a Renaissance alternate fantasy. Uh, it is very, you know, it, it has an epic feel. It has lots of characters and, I I can't even begin to imagine how you put a book like this together. But to begin with, since it's a fantasy, and that means people are going to be interested first in what is the plot to engage me. Can you explain to me um, what is what is the key, the plot, the 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 elevator pitch of Shadows in the Stone? Okay. Uh, well, I I wrote this to be an to be an alternate history, actually mm. to be a counterfactual because I I've written. Uh, uh, I, I wrote a novel called The Rebel, which which the premise is that James Dean doesn't die in the, oh my goodness uh, in that wow. accident, and he ends up hanging out with the Kennedys, and uh, uh, and 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 I, I've I've and I also did did uh, the Memory <clears throat> Cathedral, which which was a secret history, but sort of like an alternate history, which mm-hmm. is about uh, the life of Leonardo. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that book really did well for me. I mean, it, it hit the number one slot here in Australia for the age, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Fantastic. Uh, and I wanted to, I wanted to go back and, and I wanted to revisit uh, the Renaissance. Yeah. And I, I had been, I had been reading the Gnostic Gospels, which I, I don't know if, if you looked at this stuff or, or ever read any of it. This is the stuff that they that that at the Council of Nicaea they took it out. Right. And the reason they took it out because it's as if everyone was on acid. <laughs> it's, it's 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 some of the most interesting stuff that, that I've ever read. Mm. And some of the ideas uh were were such as what if Jehovah wasn't the, the one true God, right. you know, what if he was just a lower deity created out of sin? And so, I, so I thought, what would the Renaissance look like if Gnosticism were, rather were than you know, classicism, you know, what we know of the Renaissance from, you know, the yeah. Greek and the Latin uh, was the defining stimulus. So, I, so let me ask you a I, question about Gnosticism, just to make sure that I understand it, because, yeah. you know, uh, so the concept here is Jehovah is actually a a minor deity among many, but what is the universe that you and I live in? Is it still a creation of Jehovah, or is it um, uh, is is it just something where he lives? Interestingly, okay. That so when I talk about the Gnostic Gospel, uh, it's like it's like you know the book of this and the book of that. So so they don't all agree, right? Uh, but uh, in both the world we live in, yeah, where Jehovah created the universe, and right. in the Gnostic world, yeah, uh, Jehovah created the universe. But Jehovah has different name, and he is a minor god who has created the in- the universe so that you know. We're, we're, we're basically worshiping the wrong God, not right. the first, you know, not the, not, not the first, uh, not the first mover. Interesting. And, uh, and, and, and because, because for me, fiction, 
a novel is about conflict. Uh, so my demiurge, that's what they call him, you know, the semi-god, the demiurge. Yeah. Who, who, was created all of this. The book is about his the attempt of the demiurge to overthrow the first principle, to overthrow the real God and destroy everything. Excellent. And he does this, you know, I mean, you know, there's, there's all of this intimation in the book, but he does it because he would rather be first for a minute and second for eternity. <laughs> That's a very Mil- Miltonian idea, by the way. That's so uh, I, in a sense. So when I got this idea... I mean, I immediately thought of Paradise Lost. Mm-hmm. So, so this is, you know, so, so I, this is basically, you know, it's, it's, it's like the curve of the plot is Paradise Lost. But I brought something else into it. Uh, mm-hmm. When I wrote the novel, The Man Who Melted, I, I used an idea of, uh, of this psych- psychologist, Julian James, about bicameral consciousness. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's the idea that if, you know, that, that, and, that uh, that you you can kind of cut the brain in two, and mm-hmm. and there's there's like two sides. Well, his argument was that, and I don't necessarily believe this, but it was you know, writers use whatever we can. Right. But you don't have to believe that, the thing that you're using either. You just decide this could be true for the book, that's whether right. you whether you believe it. Right. Yeah. That's that's exactly right. So. According to him, around the time of, of, of Homer and the Iliad, uh, and when you read these books, it kind of resonates, and he makes a, a, an interesting case for it, uh, that basically humanity was, in a sense, uh, schizophrenic, and that they mm. actually could hear the voices of the God. Mm. Uh, and, and, he, and he makes a case for that. So what I wanted to do, Using that idea, I wanted to create an alternate world where the where the characters, the participants, <clears throat> literally could hear, see, and interact with angels and gods. Yeah. Uh, and so i I didn't want to just I didn't want to just create a divergent timeline. Yeah. Okay, you know, like like in the Rebel. I mean, the moment is boom, you have the accident, but James Dean lives. Yeah. And then what happened? I wanted to extrapolate an entire system of, of, of myth and belief and a possible world, an entire world. So I was, if indeed this is alternate history, my intention was to push it to the absolute edges mm-hmm. of, uh, you know, of possibility. And I got to tell you, it was, it was, it was wonderful fun to write. Uh, one of the characters is John D, you know, the guy who saw Angel, who, who, uh, uh, who had a guy who saw angels and told him what he was seeing. Mm. And uh, so all of the, <clears throat> all of the, the, the magical stuff in it, I actually had access uh, to D's volume, which was published in like 1659. Oh wow! And a, a small press republished it in the '60s, huh. and my, my my partner Janine Webb, who's also a writer, she it, it's 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 got a title that's longer than this podcast, <laughs> but it's basically it's basically something to do with called action with spirit. And so for spells, for all of the interactive stuff, I was actually using his material. That's perfect. No, I that see, I I actually really. I identify with that a lot, you know, where you'll, you'll go find, this is the most fun when you're, when you're doing novel writing, really, is go get some primary text and, you know, especially cookbooks, you know, especially like, like, you know, uh, you know, al- al- alchemical diaries and so forth and, and just use them. Just, you know, like, just, <laughs> just, well, I really up. Are twins. you know, when yeah. this, We'll have to continue this over the, you know, over the over the years. But uh, yes, <clears throat> but we seem to work uh, because it's, <clears throat> you know, when I was doing the original research for, uh, you know, for the Memory Cathedral. Yeah, you have to ask questions because you, you've got to see this stuff in your head. Uh, you know, how did how did people sleep? You know, yeah. where did they go to the bathroom? I mean, all of this. All, you know, what did they eat? You know, how Boy, is that. It, that's hard stuff. 
Yeah, and you know, and in my experience, what you do is you, you guess, don't you? I mean, because sometimes you can't find it at all. You might find hints and stuff, but in the end, you just have to take a flying leap and, and, yeah. and go. Yeah, there's, there's lots of flying leaps, and yeah. my 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 preference when I can get it is primary text. I mean, mm-hmm. like in 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 the uh, in the memory cathedral, there's this thing where. Uh, where it's mentioned that uh, a child was born with two heads and that meant blah, blah, blah. Well, I got this out of an actual apothecary's diary. Yeah. But most of the stuff is secondary text by people who are, who are trying to write about the yeah. period. And there's more and more uh, material about, about, you know, the personal. But, you know, I don't know how it is for you, Jason, but when I'm writing, I mean, I can't start until I can sort of hear those characters talking in my head. Mm. It just that depends works. to me. For, it, it, it just, uh, I'm not the person who, who said this, but I, I think Stephen King made this observation where he was like, different projects, you try to trick yourself into writing in a bunch of different ways. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's absolutely right. I, yeah. I, I, I really think that's right. And they... Uh... Sometimes it's the world. Sometimes it's it's just a snatch of dialogue that you're going to start with right you know and you do you know the characters before you even know what they're going to do um so you know there's just so many different ways and And in fact what strikes me is hmm. you're absolutely well this is a big book though like uh, what i'm curious about as a writer for you you know you've got this world and and the thing that you that you're most in love with is is just this question of of just just chock full making this world live and breathe but how do you actually write the novel i mean like how do you like if you were talking to your students you know how do you come up with a story that that makes it hang together you know when you have all of these ideas about the world does that does that make sense as a question you know like you know at some point uh in 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 my in my blathering career uh i said something to the effect that uh, uh, that basically what motivates me is that when I'm writing, I'm constantly surprised. Mm. And I mean, that, that w- which I'm getting the lines wrong, but it, it ended up, it ended up becoming a meme. I mean, I, I you know, it was, I went to a web page for, for a military college and, 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 and it, it, it was, it was mentioned uh, there. So yeah. what I do usually, for me, it's 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 either visual or plot. Okay, mm-hmm. so for the for the memory cathedral, I was sitting. I mean, this is you know, this sounds like it's out of a book, but I was sitting in the Algonquin and I was <laughs> reading a book about Leonardo, and I had it was almost like a hallucination. Uh, I could see these these Renaissance looking aircraft flying mm. over the River Arno. Mm. You know, the the, the river reflect. And it was from that that I I knew that I had to create uh, that I had to create this novel, and uh, and so that's when I started doing the research so that I could get uh, an idea of a plot curve, so that I could get, as you were saying, you know, as 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 Steve said, entrance in, into the book. Yeah. Uh, and then I keep going back and forth as I discover. As I discover new things, uh, but for the silent, I saw the plot like it was railroad tracks you huh. know, running running ahead of me. So it wasn't it wasn't visual. But again, there's always that element of surprise. So as yes. I was writing, as I was writing the silent, my pro- it, it was it, it's a, a first person his, his historical novel uh, told from uh, the point of view of like a 14 year old who's seen his parents killed and is now running, you yeah. know, on his own, uh, you know, through the through the the Civil War South. Yeah. And and so everything he sees has to go through his sensorium. This is the thing with first person people don't realize it mm. feels like it's an easy voice. You know, and then I sat down and I was having a good time and we were all party. But you have to somehow get in lots of information that maybe that protagonist, you know, right. wouldn't know. You wouldn't know, have access uh, to. That's right. Well- or wouldn't care about necessarily, <laughs> or, 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 or wouldn't care about because he is so traumatized, and, and that's yeah. why the, the book was called Silent. He's so traumatized that he thinks that if he doesn't 
talk or he stands still that he can't be seen. Mm. Uh, but the reason that I mention this in terms of surprise, uh, I had written about a quarter of the book and suddenly I heard Monday in my mind. Of course, I don't believe, you know, that the characters are real. You know, I'm not, you sure. know, I'm, I'm, I may be neurotic. I don't think I'm psychotic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I yeah. heard him narrating the in- his own introduction to the book. Yeah. So I, I basically it was like taking dictation, except at the end, it, 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 you know, he ended it Monday McDowell, the, the date, Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh-huh. And I thought, well, None of the book takes place in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Right. So I right. had to go back and figure out what that was about. And when I have to work within those narrow confines, that's when the interesting stuff comes out. Oh, and there was, there's a, I'll stop after this. There's a lovely uh, postscript to this. When when the book was published, it was it was published by by Morrow in the states uh, mm-hmm. and Harper Collins here in Australia. When the book was published, the Amazon uh, and it was on Amazon. You know, they finally fixed it, but it said "The Silent" by Monday McDowell and Jack Dan. Oh, so cool. my character actually got to uh, write his. Uh, to get credit for his introduction that's that's really cool and it, and it harkens back to it used to be quite the thing where where everything is a found manuscript you know it's yeah, like yeah. Uh, a man snuck into my office early in the morning and laid a manuscript on my desk just as right. i was <laughs> right. we're, we're, yeah H- <laughs> welcome to hg wells and uh... yes <laughs> What I was thinking of, though, you, you said there about Scranton, and suddenly you have to know where it. Those choices. What I love about choices is they is they lock doors, so that, you know they they close off tracks that you can follow, and it will give you interesting challenges. You know, and you have to make those choices, or else, or you know, my tendency is to thrash around. There's too much to do, and so if you if you make choices for sure, like like uh, you know, this guy definitely has to wind up in Scranton. I don't know why. God has said so. It just has to be there. Then, you know, the those choices begin to to move you in a direction. Let me ask another question about Shadows in the Stone. I mean, I, I, can I um, just say something? Yeah. You have absolutely, in terms of the way I write, yeah. you, have absolute, you have absolutely caught it. Because those bits become, for me, the most interesting stuff. Right. And they change the whole, the whole book. It, it, in the Memory Cathedral, I have an exorcism of Sandro Botticelli. And I had, really? I had done research, and it was all real. But I didn't want to make a big thing out of it. Right. And I, you know, and, and so I, I, I basically took it out, and I became blocked. It was as if the character huh. went on strike. Yeah, and so I finally went back and wrote it. It's like you know, it's like a, a forty-page you know part of the novel. But yeah. It was, it, it became absolutely integral to what yeah. was going on. And for me, it's finding those bits. Like in Shadows, uh, there's uh, there, there's a dirigible that's uh, powered by soul instead of air because it, it uh, you know, it's not, not powered, but it's the, the, the covering yeah. is... And so it can basically go forever. And I actually got the idea uh, from a monk who, who was writing about something similar in like, you know, the 15th century. So, I mean, you know, it's vaporware, as we would say now. But yeah. that again changed the whole plot. But it was because it's these bits and pieces that are gnarly, that are interesting, that you you know, that you want, it's like colors that you want to bring into the world. And I'm well, glad what's, that what's, well, No, but what's really funny to me about that is, um, uh, and, and, and we should get back specifically to, to this book, but what, what, what strikes me about that in the process, right, in the process of writing, is that you, as one single human being who's a writer, you have a whole box, uh, or in my mind, there's, sort of a strange circular office with a giant window in front of it that sits on top of, that sits behind my eyes. And there's a guy with gar- with uh, garters on his sleeves who's constantly rifling through cards and, and things and, and finding That's stuff. a great image. And, and, and that's just what's wandering around behind my eyes, right? And, and uh, you're constantly picking up stuff. 
And because I'm a different human being from you and from my neighbor, I'm picking up different stuff. There's nothing inherently more important about the stuff that I pick up. If I become obsessed, as I did when I was doing some research, if I become obsessed with Grace Metallion's Peyton Place, that would be the super important thing. But maybe nobody else remembers it, right? But then I go to write a book. It becomes important to me, and it probably infuses itself into that into the book, right? And the reader is just stuck with it, basically. The reader is stuck with whatever weird choices have happened, not just in the writing of the book, but in the cramming crap into my brain. And uh, I, I just find that fascinating because it means that two that's, different that's, people... That's why. Given the, yeah. that's why he's reading your book, Jason. Right, I mean, well, it's, maybe, it's yeah. because of the gnarliness of your brain and those, and those bits that, 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 that you've got, to, you know, that, that, that fascinate you. And, and right. so you, you've got to work through... I mean, that's what interests me when I'm reading a book. Right. Why is this guy obsessed with this? You, you come across a book and you go, for some reason, this guy is just, you know, I, I don't know, super obsessed with with the history of slavery or the history of cornflakes. It doesn't matter. But the fascination of the writer will come across. Um, but uh, I, I'm curious about like, like you know, some very sort of everyday stuff. You're, you're putting together, you're putting together this book. You have an outline. You said sometimes your brain will, will interfere with you and you'll deviate from it. But like, how do you, um, you know, all I know of your life is in the morning it involves, you know, going to a sunroom and chai coffee and looking at, at a beautiful setting. But like, how long does it take, um, you know, to write this book? Do you try to force yourself to like have a certain output every week or, or are you one of those guys or is that even how you work? Uh, you know, that's <laughs> that's one of those great questions, which <laughs> which I'm, I'm going to answer truthfully. Uh, right preach that you should be one of those guys <laughs> or, 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 or whatever. Uh, but for me, it's one of two things. Usually I'm working on a, on a few projects, uh-huh. i.e., you know, anthologies, short stories. The novel being the main thing, uh, I'm in two modes. I'm either researching or I'm writing. Yeah. You know, if I'm writing, which for me is, is you know, is like, you know, Joseph Campbell's bliss. Yeah. It's getting up in the morning, you know, having the tea, sitting down, and then fooling myself into uh, into that state where you can write. So mm. it may take me two hours to, uh, you know, to reach that, that alpha, whatever it is, mind state. Yeah. Once I do, I write very fast because I connect. Uh, in other words, I'm... Yeah. It's it's as if it's in a sense it's like collaborating with someone else. You know, mm-hmm. when you're collaborating, you figure, well, the guy you're writing with or, or the woman you're writing with, you know, she'll fix the screw ups. Yeah, they know what's right. They they, right. they, <laughs> they, they, they know. The know. Right choices. So it opens you up, you know. And and so for me, I, it's like collaborating with myself. Yeah. And and when I do that, there's a whole it like there's a whole sensorium that it opens up. For instance. I, don't, I can't tell you how many times I've written something and I've written a word and I said, what the hell is that? And I, I've looked it up and it was a real word huh. because, you know, I'm, I'm connected. And, yeah. and it's often when I'm hitting that, and usually I get there by editing what I've written the day before. Mm. Uh, I may hit one of those, one of those juicy bits, like uh, there's a, there's a, preoccupation with lions in in, in this book yeah. i'll hit one of those you know a, a sentence that i've written and then i have that i stop and i have to say okay what the hell have i done where is this going what does this mean do i want to erase it or uh, and if it stays in my head then i have to retrofit so right. i'm always going i'm always going back and forth because it has to feel like it's real it, it's 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 got to be it's in my head it's got to be three dimensional huh. it's so That's intimidating not- by the way i'm not one of those guys well i mean the i'm i'm think you know i'm not one of those guys the the i want to be I want to be one of those guys who writes a thousand words a day. What do I actually am is somebody who sometimes is writing like crazy. And then sometimes is just, you know, obsessed with work. You know, I, I'm a, I'm a suit at a cable company. Sometimes I'm obsessed with work. Sometimes I'm obsessed with, uh, you know, uh, I was a streaming cable company. I was one of the guys who started telemarketing in cable, but we wouldn't <laughs> go into that. But yeah, I, look, again, we're twins because it's uh, right. It's pretty same for me yeah. you know I, 
I've written a bunch of uh, stories with Barry Ballsberg, who's one of my 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 dearest pals. Okay. And uh, Barry is extraordinarily fast. So Barry can write like you know he could write five or ten thousand words a day, and he could do it every Good day. Good grief. Oh, uh, it's wow. uh, well, Bob Silverberg was the same way. He's he's like you know if you figure his pseudonyms and everything else, he, he's written something like seven hundred novels. How the I mean, hell? How? You're, you're talking to absolutely the wrong guy because you either have that kind right. of, of, a, of a headset talent. Yeah. Or you're like some, you know, I mean, look at, you know, someone like J.D. Salinger, who's one of my favorite authors. I mean, small oeuvre that. Yes. So, uh, but when we write together, you know, I'll, I'll write, this is a good idea. What do you think? Right. Two days later, there's a whole thing. I mean, there's like pages and pages. So I start rewriting, reworking, you know, putting interstitials in. And, and after a week, I, you know, I get an email, you know, what the, don't you want to write the story? And then I have to write back and say, Barry, I love you. I cannot write that fast. <laughs> and, you know, it, you know, it, it goes back and forth. You know, I did a panel uh at a, uh, it, it was a writers' festival in Melbourne years ago, and it was a, a bunch of in quote hot writers, and uh-huh. uh, I, I was kind of moderating it. And I asked, you know, I was asking people how they work. Yeah. And it's amazing because everyone. That's why it's so hard to teach writing. Yeah. You know, there was one person who did an outline of each and every scene. Mm-hmm. Everything, you know, everything was absolutely there. The other side, the, 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 there was a, a, a terrific writer, a woman who basically drew an idea out of a bowl where she put ideas and that, and she would use that, sit down and start the novel. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then there's all of the rest of us in between. Like I, yeah. I need, I, I need some kind of a, Plot. I, I need the plot arc. I need to know where it's going. You ever talk to Kevin J. Anderson? Do you have, yeah, have, I know. Have, I know yeah. Kevin. He's, he's a lovely guy. So he actually lives near here. He lives over here in, in Colorado Springs, in fact. Um, but he uh, he does we his audio. One of my books together with 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 uh, and I think it was uh, was it a comic? I can't remember. Uh, in a wrestling rink with. Uh, with, with the you know the, the national conference of wrestlers, it was great fun. <laughs> That's cool. Sorry, that was in the side. No, he does so much. Stuff. He has and a series I actually called. Guy, if I do tell him, I apologize. Well, he so Kevin uh, runs his own press as well, and and he had you know so he writes for major publishers. Also does the publishing thing. He's written a lot of Star Wars books and a lot of his own stuff. He just writes, 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 writes all the time. And he's one of those guys who I'm not making this up. Literally says. If you're in the airport and you got 20 minutes before your plane takes off, you know, that's at least 15 minutes you could be riding. I mean, so really, literally, he's one of those guys. But the way that he does it is it's all audio. He actually, he speaks his books and he has them transcribed. And so he can just throw down books like they are sacks of meal. Just like, wham, you know, there's 20,000 words, bam. And I, <laughs> wow. You know, uh, I mean... For instance, you know, Joe Haldeman writes with a beautiful fountain pen. Mm. Uh, if I write with a fountain pen, because I'm a, I'm a fountain pen nut too, it re- it changes my style. I bet it would. You know, so, uh, I mean, you know, and I, I've tried doing it. I've tried talking to a microphone. You know, it, I mean, we, we all find our own way. And, yeah. and we, you can't compare yourself. You know, there, there's a story which is probably apocryphal. I could yeah. ask Bob about this because he's, he's you know, I mean, we, we've, we've known each other for a lifetime, yeah. uh, Bob, Bob Silverberg. But there was a story that I had heard that uh, Bob used to share an office with another writer. Well, Bob would come in, write, I guess, six or 7,000 words, whatever it was, get up, and that was it. And the other guy is sitting there, they were sharing an office, and was trying to get to his five hundred. Well, I'm one of the guys who is trying to get to the 500. Sure. You know what we used to do for fun in college is uh, we would go, and I guess this is just how lame we were, really. But, I mean, you know, like Friday night, we (laughs) were So, like, Friday night, hey, what do you want to do? We would get our, our laptops. And we would go to like this giant like conference hotel, enormous lobby, and sit down and like just write. And that was what we would do for fun. It was it was such a blast. I miss those days. 
But well, I'm sorry. I have gals who still do that. Uh, huh? I, I have I have friends who you know they 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 have their own writers groups and they do get together and. Uh, you know, I feel and, like and, as you get older and as you get more married and all this stuff, all those opportunities kind of filter away. You know, um, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> well, I think there's I think there's two things. Uh, in terms of like workshop, yeah, I came through, you know, uh, the Milford, the Guilford Writers Workshop with, with mm. uh, you know, you know, with, with like George Alec Effinger, Joe Haldeman, uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Gardner Dozois, uh, Michael Swan, we call, and I mean, these became lifelong pals, and no kidding, you would get to know each other's work, and 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 the criticism was part of a part of the warp and woo. That is really cool. At, at, at Guilford's my my job usually we'd we'd have a guest writer. I mean, some mm-hmm. sometimes it would be you know as, you know someone who was who was unbelievable like Chip Delaney, and and in those days Roger Zelazny used to be the the kind sure. of parent to come to the party but uh we'd invite new people and after we had done a go around over their their story they would be absolutely some people would be absolutely shattered mm-hmm. and i would i would be the one to try to you know say look you can do this we can put this together it's almost a certain type of person there are people mm-hmm. who just you know are really solitary and that's how they work and that's how they you know i, I mean that's that's their personality and i have I have one dear friend who, you know, who's, who's a phenomenal writer and I'm not, and she's very private, so I'm not going to mention her name, Sure, but you know, that, you know, going to a workshop would be, you know, that, you know, that would be like getting root canal without uh, anesthesia. The cool, the cool thing here was that um, you had accountability. So it was like, Hey, let's go out and, and do some writing. And, you know, you didn't have necessarily have to share your work with, your partner but the point was you were both supposed to be working and that was that was great i mean that was just it was the, those those were good days that was that was really cool well look at you know i've always been jealous of screenwriters <clears throat> and mm. tv writers because they're working together yeah you know, i mean it's like collaborating you're, you you know you're throwing ideas back and forth you're writing it's it's i mean a good collaboration take hey, you know with a bad collaboration both partner's weaknesses come mm-hmm. to the fore. With a good collaboration, uh, you know, it's the strengths that come to the fore. Right. And there was a period, uh, this is during the 80s, where uh, Gardner Dozois, myself, uh, Michael Swanwick, uh, Gar- Gardner's partner, Susan Casper, we were, we were writing short stories, collaborating, passing them back and forth that way. Yeah. And in those days where most writers were making, you know, like three cents a word, we were selling to all the slicks. You know, we were uh, selling to Playboy and Penthouse and Omni. Sure. And uh, I mean, we were making, you know, for, for a short, you know, for a short story, what, you know, what some people are making for, for, for a novel. Oh, it's and fantastic. It was just, it was just pure joy. But what was happening uh, is that we brought our strengths to it. And we had one of the best editors in the universe because Gardner would have, uh, uh, w- you know, he he would we would we would allow him if that's the word because basically he just did it. He would do the, the last, uh, you know, the last conforming draft. Ah, uh, yeah, that makes sense. That makes but that makes total stories, sense. I couldn't write by myself. The, the 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 thing that I would most like a collaborator on, you know, as you're working your way through a book is when you go, okay, uh, this is a scene we've seen a thousand times where they, they've been asked to come and trade a thing for the person. The bad guys have said, hey, good guys, come trade the MacGuffin for this person that we've kidnapped and we'll give them to right. So, you know, we've seen this scene a thousand times. You got to do it. But what, what's going to make it different? What can we do here? Having a friend that you can call up and go, please help me. I, I, I just... <laughs> that's, that's so valuable. And um, that those are the times when I really would love a collapse. Yeah, and I do call people up and go, "Help me out with this," you know. But that's the best I can do. Yeah, well, I I do the same. I mean, you know, basically, I learned you know I, I learned that from Harlan Ellison. You yeah. know, if if he needed if he needed information, he'd call you know someone like you know on physics, he'd call Greg Benford and say, "How does this work?" Cool. Uh, so yeah, you. You know, we we use you know we use all of that stuff, but yeah. it's it's 
for me, it's and it, it was certainly true with, with shadows. It was coming across. It was coming across for whatever reason. These strange, uh, these strange bits uh, yeah. in the research, which lead you onto paths you'd never guess. For instance, uh, one of the protagonists, uh, who's who's actually uh, part of the the pantheon of angels. Uh, is a young woman who uh, takes a balloon ride out of uh, our universe during the Civil War and ends up wow. and <laughs> ends up in hell. I mean, ends up in our in our uh, conception of hell. And I had, uh, you know, a lot of what I do is is really visual. And mm-hmm. in the shadows in the stone, there are a number of interior. Uh, uh, etchings, which come from a, 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 an edition of Paradise Lost, and I saw those etchings, and I modeled hell on that. I, 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 I'm uh-huh. not, now, you've got to understand that uh, it's not the demiurge who's the devil, right? I mean, the, you see, you've still got you've, you've still got Satan there in in, right. in this universe that I've that I've created, but he's basically he, he he's he's basically another angel in the demiurge, you know, in Jehovah's in in in, in the the secondary god's pantheon, the god who, you know, who, who who created us. But when I looked at these etchings, I mean they were so weird and so strange mm. that they just stayed in my head and they ended up in the book. And so a lot of stuff that a, a lot of the, the a lot of those details yeah. that you can't find anywhere else, I guess, just like in your book, what you were talking about, you know, your those obsessions, yeah. uh, those are brought, you know, those are brought to life because but that's what, and that's what makes people, that's what makes a book memorable to people. When people talk about shadows in the stone, they talk about, this is, this is a really vividly realized world that feels real that, and, and I believe that the fact that it's chock full of, of, all of these things that you've, you know, it, it, people could say it's like showing your work, basically. But it's not like that. It's more like it's just filling out the world and making it making it unique. And, and I think that's that's really important. And and it speaks well that people have said that that people have have really loved it. By the way, I'm looking at one of the etchings right now, and it's really gorgeous. I mean, the, <laughs> so the, yeah, they're, so they're, the art is really nice. Uh, yeah, you know, as a writer, I. When I when I when I'm working, uh, I I think fiction works something like the way our eyes work. Mm. I mean, we pick up, uh, you know, when we look at something, we pick up detail here, detail there, and then we we and then without realizing it, you know, our our sensorium puts it together. Mm. And so what the writer is doing when he he's picking out those significant particular details, yeah, which allows the reader. Who's looking at it to f- to fill in the rest so that it so that it feels like reality? I mean, that's the yes. you know, it's that it's that layering. Uh, yeah, and that where and that, people want to run around. This is the way people have expressed it to me: is that they want to run around in that, and that's why they keep going back to books that become a series. Is you know they they like this world; they want to run around in it, and and that world is the creation of this particular this particular artist um right. you know you mentioned mark exactly. and goodness gracious that's the and by the way is this are you going to return to this world that you've that that you've created in shadows or 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 is it one and done are you going to do another i okay i had originally uh, you know this is how writers are really were so different i, I thought well i had sworn that uh, that i was you know never going to do uh uh you know like 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 you know, one of these huge fantasy uh, series. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. the wrong thing, of course. And I would have told you unconscious. I, and I was thinking of, <coughs> and I was, I was thinking of, of George Martin's work. I mean, George is, George is unique in an interesting way in that, and that you could call these works fat fantasy, but I mean, I, mean, I think George is, is is our is our modern Tolkien. Uh, mm-hmm. Line by line, he's just a beautiful writer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I thought, okay, I'm going to try that. Well, once I put it through my sensorium and through my rattled, uh, crazed, frothing brain, uh, it became something entirely different. And yeah. it became one book. And I think the reason it did is, would you do it, you know, would you do a, a sequel to Paradise Lost? I mean, 
the book encompass, uh, you know, the world, the historical world, the yeah. Renaissance, uh, you know, America in the 1860s for a while, heaven and hell. Yeah. With a cast of characters who are experiencing what most Christians believe in, okay? They were experiencing viscerally. So, yeah. you know, one of the main characters in the novel is the angel Gabriel. Right. And so when I describe him, I have to describe, well, you know, what is an angel made out of? How, you know, how does he appear? How, you know, so, so these were, you know, so... These were the questions in my mind that, you know, that, that, uh, that I was trying to answer. And yeah. when the book closed at the end, it was so final that I could not open it up again. Interesting. So, yes, I wanted, I, I had planned on writing it as three books, but the, uh, the story, which I often see as another, as, as another character, as another extension of, 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 of self, uh, you know, finished it. I think it's nuts that you've got this stuff. For, forgive me, but I, but that you've got this stuff from from the Civil War. <laughs> that's, yeah, well, that, that's... You see, these are the uh, you know, the, these are the these are the crazy surprises. Yes, because, right, uh, right, and, exactly. And, yeah, and it, it's the, it's the stuff that. Uh, how do I say this? It's it's the it's the stuff that uh, informs the the entire book, which yeah. which when I began, which when I started, uh, I I would never right. I, I I simply would never have have guessed it. So this character is Louisa Louisa Mary Morgan. She's a sixteen year old incarnation of Sophia, the mm-hmm. snake goddess and mother of the demiurge Yaldabaoth. And yeah. Yaldabaoth is the is Jehovah, is the demiurge. And she doesn't know that. So, I mean, I've got all of these characters. So her 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 path to realization and to understanding and to growth and becoming herself is this entire, you know, that's that's its own plot. Right. And the part that she, and and the absolutely vital part she plays, because as Sophia, it was Sophia who gives birth to the demiurge in secret, uh, you know, hiding from, from, you know, the first principle from, from in quote, God's eyes. Yeah. So, so all of this stuff, you know, so it becomes, it becomes, I mean, the plot itself is, is, is straightforward, but the complexity grows as you write, as you write it until, you know, it's like, I guess it's like having, you know, this is you know, so silly. Everyone has said that it really is like having a child at some point. It be, it is so much itself that if I go back and read my, and, and read say shadows, yeah, it's as someone else has written it. It's, it's, you know, right. Uh, and and no, I, I, I completely I, identify yeah. with that. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and wow. I think that's the, that's the joy of being. I mean, you you've put something into the world. This this like glowing thing that's in your head. Yeah, you know, when you were talking about you know sitting and and see, you know seeing the cards and and making the choices, and in a sense that becomes real and it becomes real for other people. Mm-hmm. Yes, right, and they'll and they will wind up sort of reacting to your cards and going. I want to go back to that guy because I, I enjoyed that. And I have to say, me as a reader, I find I often like the odd choices, like the sudden appearance of a Confederate cat, uh, officer or, or you know, the, you know, all that stuff. Is, it's one of the things I like about Stephen King that people don't give him enough credit for is he'll suddenly go, you know, what if it's a, ch- a wind up chattering teeth that this person's be-? like his, in other words, the goofy, the goofy choices. Those are the exciting choices that you remember, you know, and, and, and I'm always shocked at people who, who reject that stuff. They go, you know, this just took me right out. It was so unexpected. I'm like, what's the matter with you? <laughs> and, 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 and King's great talent for me yeah. is his work is so unbelievably layered that it's absolutely real. Yeah. It's as real as my table when, yeah. I, you know, when, uh, you know, when I read it and, and you know, I think you know. I'm a, as you are. I'm I'm a big media fan. You know, right. movies. You know, but when you, when we're watching a film, it's given to us. That's right. The character is there. It's that's the character. It's it's you know, and 
and sometimes it works like like the first uh, you know like the first three films that they did of Lord of the Rings, which I thought couldn't be done. I mean, it, def- yeah. it, it was definitive. But with a book for the reader, it's participatory. Any character that you create or that I create is going to be different in every reader's mind because the reader is involved in that creative activity of constructing that world according to the guideposts you've given her yeah. and, and, and their experience. And it's interactive in a way that, that, that it's difficult for media to be, Yeah, I think. I mean, I could be you know, full of crap. I've often been uh, told. No, that. no, but I think, I think, that's, I think that's, that's exactly right. Um, and I, well, I have to say, though, it hasn't – I feel differently about this than when I was young. Uh, when, I was, when I was young, if I had read a book and I had a vision in my head of what Hannibal Lecter was like, right? Uh, to think of, of Harris, uh, Thomas Harris. Right, right. No, I'm with you. Uh, <laughs> have a vision in my head of what Hannibal Lecter is like. Then a movie comes out, and performance is amazing, but, I mean, there's a part of you that goes, yeah, that's not the way I pictured it, so I reject this, right? I don't feel right. that way anymore. Now I, now I really, really have come around to, there's a million Hannibal Lecters. There's one in my head, there's one there, there's one on the TV. It's all just a bunch of stuff, you know. It's all just a compare and contrast. It's fine. In other words, I've become more excited now by the constant re refiguring of all these things. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter to me if 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 there is deviation it doesn't i could not care less if there's ever a good adaptation of the book dracula i don't even really think that it's possible (laughs) because i I absolutely agree with that uh i find it i find it uh more interesting and i think that i mean an adaptation of of a book into a movie is a to do that well that's a complete creative act of its own it's right it's, you know it's not it's not the book it's uh yeah it's its own yeah, thing it's not, exactly it's yeah. yeah anyway all right i know we've we've gone far and wide but uh jack dan the the book is shadows in the stone it is a really striking what i would call gnostic fantasy that's the that's the least way that i could that i could interpret it from ifwg um and and I, I really had a delightful time talking. Like, really, truly a delightful time. It was a lot of fun. Jason, this, and, was, this was great fun. We'll have to keep in touch. And, I'll, and I, I'm going to now read all your work. Oh, well, I don't know Come if I recommend that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, I appreciate that very much. Um, reach out to me anytime. And, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Have a wonderful okay, Saturday. Great fun. Yes, sir. All okay. right. Bye.